to be stand for the next few songs. Pressing on my heart through the week.
it's good by me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, and I trust that each one of us can claim that from the depths of our hearts, that you are our living hope. God, without you, there is no hope, there is no life, there is nothing that is worthwhile. And God, we're so grateful to have a God such as you, a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, a God who gave himself for us. Father, we've gathered together here this morning to worship you, to praise you, and we pray, Lord, that we would do so from the depths of our hearts, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And God, we're, we're grateful that you have given us this opportunity to be here this morning to worship together in this way. Father, we thank you for giving us safety as we traveled here this morning. We pray for others who are still coming that you would just watch over and protect them. And God, as we spend this time together here today, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to speak to our hearts, continue to speak to our minds. And not only would be that we would receive what you have for us, but Lord, that we would put it into practice in our hearts and in our lives. We're not here just to gain knowledge in our heads. We're here, Lord, to, to learn to grow more and more into the image of your dear son, Jesus Christ. So God, help us to do that as we spend time together here today. Father, again, we're grateful for this opportunity. Bless each part of the service here today. And Lord, that all of it would honor and glorify you. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Again, good morning, Christian greetings to each one of you. For those that are visiting, we extend a special welcome to you. Good to see you here with us today. If you care to open your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter 19 for our devotions this morning. Book of Psalms, chapter 19, a familiar psalm for many of you, I'm sure. First few verses of this psalm talk about how creation gives evidence that there is a God. We can't help but notice that there's a creator, there's a God, there is someone who is much bigger than us. In each and everything that we see in each and every day, uh, his, his word goes out, we see it, we see him in all of creation. And I'd like to look at verses 7 through 11 
uh, for our devotional reading this morning. Psalm chapter 19, beginning with verse 7. Scripture says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. More, moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. What the psalmist is talking about is the word of God, what you are holding in your hands right at this moment. Do we value it? Do we understand the worth of what we have in our hands? It is perfect. God's word is perfect. You cannot make any improvements to it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing that needs to be added or subtracted from it. It is perfect. It's perfect because the giver of it is perfect, because God himself is perfect. And only by his word and only through him can our souls be converted, can we be changed into his likeness. Only by his word can we understand who he is and what he's like, by him speaking to us. His word is sure. It makes the simple wise. It gives understanding to those who don't have understanding. It gives learning to those who are unlearned. The things that it teaches, the the statutes, the lessons are right. They make our heart to rejoice. His commandments are pure. It gives light to our eyes. It helps us to see the path we should go and the, the ways that we should walk. And all of this put together, the psalmist says, it's to be desired more than gold. More than gold, more than fine gold. Not only is it valuable, but it's sweet. Sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Now honey, my understanding is, is the, the sweetest natural, natural thing occurring uh, in our world. You can make things that are sweeter than that, but they have to be processed. But honey is the, is the sweetest natural thing substance that there is. The psalmist says God's word is sweeter than honey. Not only is it good, not only is it valuable, but it is sweet. And I don't know about you, but I like sweets. <laughs> I like sweets. I'm sort of coming down off my Christmas crash a little bit. Still got a few things left that I'm trying to clean up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just enjoy that stuff. I shouldn't be eating as much of it as I should, but it, it, you crave it. You desire it. You want it. Why? Because it's sweet. Is the word of God the same way to me? Do I desire it? Do I want it? Do I want to get into it? Do I want to just, just devour it? Because it is sweet. It is so, so good. We gather together here this morning, I, I trust, to spend time in God's word, listening to it, talking about it, sharing it with each other. Let's remember how valuable it is and let, let's, let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy the sweetness of God's word as we spend time in it today. Let's pray again, shall we? Father, again, we're just so grateful to have your word so available and and so easily accessible to us. God, help us never to take it for granted and help us to to realize as well, Father, that your word is not just for our our mental knowledge, for an accumulation of things in our head, but Lord, it's, it's for us to live by as we learn that we can grow closer to you by living out the things that we're learning, the things that your word is teaching us. That it is perfect. It, it, it helps make us simple. Those of us that are simple make us wise. And, and it's, it just leads us, it directs us, gives light to our eyes and a, and a path for us to follow. And God, we pray that each one of us would desire it more than anything else. And we would recognize how sweet and how good it is. And that we would just have a craving for it, a desire to be in it, to spend time in it, and to enjoy it. So God, help us as we do that here today. And Lord, help us as we do that throughout this coming week as we spend time in our winter Bible school. We're so grateful for that as well. So bless our time together here today and this week. Father, we'll be sure to give you all the honor and glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And to thee beyond all worlds by faith I soar before thy bound.
on this majesty I stand in silence and adore but Savior thou art by my side thy voice I hear thy face I see thou art my friend my day Spirit in my heart dost make thy temple day by day the Holy Ghost of God the heart yet dwellest in this house of Trinity in whom alone all things created moved or rest high in the heavens thou hast thy throne thou hast thy throne within Number 546. Number 546. And those who care to may stand. Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the depths of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock. A dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. My life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each morning I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, 
the shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation his wonderful love I shout with the millions on high he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock the shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand Father, this morning we're grateful for, again, this opportunity to open your word, to be nourished, to be fed, to be challenged. God, we thank you for the word that you've laid on Nathan's heart. Just a blessing this morning as he shares that word. Help us to receive it as your word. Put it into practice in our hearts and our lives. Lord, just free his mind, free his lips. Help him to share without fear or favor of man what you've laid on his heart. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Is that what that's Well, good morning to you. It really is a pleasure to be back with you. I'm always honored when I get invited to speak someplace, but when I get invited back, I'm a little suspicious. So uh, for those of you who uh, I met last time, you, you know what you're in for, I guess. Uh, it was a busy, busy week the last time that I was here, so when Myron called and asked if I would do it again, I said, yeah, but can I tag team this? Can I, can I bring a friend? And, uh, and you were gracious to invite Cameron along. I wonder this morning if you would turn in your Bible to the book of Jonah with me snuggled in there between Obadiah and Micah. It's um, a book that sometimes maybe gets skipped over, and I want to convince you as we go through this this morning that this is not a children's story, and it's certainly not a story about a fish. Um, but I, uh, I think there are a number of different ways in which we can look at that at several different angles. One of those would be the, the missions aspect of what's going on there. I think there's a lot to be learned about the concepts of divine mercy and judgment, but I want to look at a little bit at the angle of this as we look at sort of the idea of God's sovereignty and human responsibility and what it is exactly that we are and what he might have for us. And this is uh, not just an introduction to the book of Jonah. It's a, I, I hope, sets a precedent for us as we move throughout this whole entire week. A long, long time ago, my great-grandfather and a friend of his who was a seminary professor were fishing in a rowboat off the eastern shore of Maryland. And uh, they weren't having a whole lot of luck where they were at, so they decided to collect their gear and row to another place. And uh, as they were pulling in their gear, they got into a heated theological discussion, and uh, it kind of intensified as it went, and the harder they argued, the harder they rowed. And so they, uh, at a certain amount of time, had exhausted themselves and felt like they had exhausted the topic, and they looked around and said, oh, well, this looks like a good spot to fish. We're going to set the argument aside, and we're going to fish. And they went to throw down their anchor and realized that actually they had never picked their anchor up in the first place. Uh, in their argument, they had rode their hearts out and gotten nowhere. And uh, it's sort of a funny story. You think, how could you do that? Well, maybe you haven't been in a theological argument with a seminary professor before. But the, there's a humorous story to that, but there's the illusion of progress without actually moving anywhere. And I have to admit to you that I've listened to sermons in that posture where there's the illusion of progress, but I haven't moved anywhere. And I've probably preached sermons like that before where there's the illusion of progress, but practically speaking, I didn't move anywhere. And so my hope is, is that as we go through looking at Jonah here, that we would put ourselves in a posture that whatever the Lord has for us this week, we would be open to receiving that and that we would be people who could be appointed by him uh, to do the right thing. It's customary as you start in on the book of Jonah to make some joke about it being a whale of a tail or there's something slightly fishy about it and all of that. But as we go into it, I want to convince you that the fish in this is probably, well, it's probably in the top 10 interesting things that happen, but it is certainly by no stretch of imagination 
the only surprising thing that happens in it. And I got stuck on this because uh, I'll be using the, the NIV this morning, but I enjoy a lot of different translations. And I was looking, particularly in chapter 4, there's a, a phrase in there that, that got stuck in my mind over the last few months, and it's this. And uh, this is in Jonah chapter 4, verse 7. And, in the, and I was reading the New American Standard at the time, and it says, And the Lord appointed a worm. And the Lord appointed a worm. So as my friend and colleague Cameron McAllister and I were setting off on a, a new adventure, looking at ways in which we could serve the church, and we would run into things that uh, were frustrating our plans a little bit, Cameron would call and say, how is this project going? And I would say, well, the Lord appointed a worm. And that was my code for saying, oh, there's, there's something that's other than what I would like there. But it gets interesting as we look at it is that the worm is not the only thing that is appointed in the book of Jonah. And so what I would like to do is just walk through Jonah. I'm not going to read it all, but just highlight some things as we go through to kind of set the stage so we're all on the, on the same page of kind of what the big story is and what's happening. So you have Jonah. Actually, Jonah is rec- referenced in 2 Kings chapter 14. He comes in the sequence of prophets right after Elisha. So there's the, the record of him. Yes, pretty short, 2 Kings chapter 14. So uh, Jonah's uh, part of the Isra- Israelite prophetic tradition. And God tells him to go up to Nineveh. Their wickedness, their trouble has come up before him, and he's going to send a prophet. And uh, Jonah says, thanks for the offer, no thanks, and jumps the ship and takes off and gets out of there. And I like the translations that, that highlight the fact that it says that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And so then in verse 4, the NIV says the Lord sent a great wind. If you're looking at uh, others, you'll see maybe provided or appointed or ordered a great wind. And I, and I like that provided and ordered and appointed, well, the, the appointed and the ordered a little bit more. It has a bit more intentionality to saying that God was doing this. The, the wind wasn't really a provision. It was an appointed thing by God in order to accomplish his will. And so crashes in, you know, the sailors are all trying to figure out what's going on. Jonah's asleep in the bottom of the ship. Uh, they come down and get a hold of him and they say, hey, what in the world's going on? The captain gets him and they said, you know, cry out to your God and... Uh, Jonah basically says, well, you know, it's, it's my fault that you're here. And they don't want to throw him over. They cast lots to make sure. And so it's interesting that the Lord also is sovereign over that. They think what they're doing is something that will produce a random chance that God directs that. And so Jonah can say, yes, it's because of me. And so the Lord directs and appoints that. And then Jonah does, in fact, get thrown overboard. And one of the things that's interesting um, is that this whole interaction that happens with Jonah and the sailors is that they come out of that worshiping the Lord. They're fearful of taking his life. And in verse 16, it says, at this, the men feared greatly the Lord and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to him. In the fourth century BC, that's before Christ, not before COVID, fourth century BC, um, there were a group of Greek scholar, Greek and Hebrew scholars that translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And I like um, some of the wording that they used in doing this because uh, they, they show the repetition that's there in Hebrew. And so in that verse it says, and the men feared the Lord with great fear and they sacrificed a sacrifice and they vowed vows. And then you would say, and then they moved on down to the Department of Redundancy Department. Um, but it's, it's not that there's redundancy based and it's that this repetition gives us an emphasis on what it is we're supposed to be looking at as we go through this story. And what's fascinating to me is that by the time we get to the chapter end of chapter 1, it's been pointed out three times that what Jonah is doing is he is attempting to flee from the presence of the Lord. In fact, he tells them that. That's part of why they go down and ask him, what are you doing? Which God are you fleeing from? And he said, I'm fleeing from the God who made the earth and the seas. And they're like, dude, what are you doing? It's a terrible idea. What I like about it is it says that he had previously told them that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever like traveled to a foreign country and you go up to customs with your passport and they kind of grill you of why you're in the country. State the reason, you know, you check off business or pleasure and then they ask you questions about that. State the reason for your visit. I'm fearing the presence of the Lord. Oh, okay, come on in. (laughs) It's hard for me to imagine how that conversation actually happened, but that's what Jonah is doing. He's trying to get away. And then in the last verse of chapter one, the Septuagint has it and the Lord ordered a great sea monster. Uh, Some of you have provided, some have appointed, uh, ordered uh, a great fish. And the Lord appointed, I I like the imagery there of the Lord ordering a great sea monster, but uh, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and he was in the fish for three days. So he has this uh, time of, and and actually, I don't know why we fixate on this. 
this is not really that much more fascinating than God shutting the mouths of lions, sending crows to feed people. Uh, this, is, this isn't really that spectacular in light of what goes on in the Old Testament. So obviously this is one that I think when you think of Jonah, you automatically think of, of the Lord ordering a fish to do his will. But God does the same thing with animals all throughout the Old Testament. So in some ways this really shouldn't surprise us. And then in the belly um, of the fish, or as uh, the Septuagint has it, Jonah says he cried out from the belly of Hades or from the depths of the grave because God was with him there, even there. And then in the end of that chapter, we'll look back at his prayer in a bit, but it goes on to say, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the land. So Jonah, um, you'll notice that the first verse of Jonah chapter three and the first verse of Jonah chapter one are very similar. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Uh, except this time when he says, go to Nineveh, in verse 3 of chapter 3, it says, and Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord because the whole ship thing didn't really work out the last time. I guess he had a choice here to try something else, um, but he had a change of heart somewhere in the belly of the fish. So Jonah does go to Nineveh, and he begins, he's, it's a three-day journey to get across it, and he begins to preach, and as you know, there's a, a, a wild revival takes place. Everybody starts repenting. It's fun to... Well, maybe it's a distraction in my mind to start thinking about what this actually looked like uh, when the ruler of the city orders that they don't feed any of their animals or give them any water for three days and that they put sackcloth on them. Uh, those of you who are familiar with cows can imagine what your barn would sound like two days into this if you didn't feed or water your animals and if you tried to put all sackcloth on all of them. I've, you think the fish is amazing, try coming up with enough sackcloth to cover your cattle. That's a, a whole other category there. But anyway, it's a sign of great repentance. And you know what? Their repentance is genuine, and the Lord sees it. He sees that they're turning from their evil and their violence, and he has compassion on them. Some of us have been, uh, maybe have a sanitized version of this. If you've ever watched the Veggie Tales, that the great sin of Nineveh is that they were slapping each other with fishes. Um, I don't think that's probably historically accurate, but they were sinning, and then they repented, and then God relented from the disaster that he was going to bring on them. And then we begin chapter 4 with Jonah being greatly displeased. And he says, basically, I told you so. What was the purpose of me coming here? I knew that you were this type of God. I knew that you were going to forgive them. That's why I was so quick to flee. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. And then a God who relents from sending calamity. And then, what an attitude for a prophet. It's better for me to die, verse 3. And the Lord says, do you, really, do you really have the right to be angry? And so Jonah goes out. I don't know what he's thinking. He's going to sit on the east side of the city and just watch and see what happens. And it says in verse 6 that the Lord provided or the Lord appointed or the Lord ordered a vine. So the Lord speaks and orders a vine. And that is a quickly growing vine because it pops right up there. And it covers Jonah and he's in the shade. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But the next morning... The Lord appointed a worm, which chewed through the vine, so it withered, and then the Lord sent a scorching east wind. If you have the King James, I like the vehement wind. Uh, the wind blew vehemently. Uh, this is a scorching hot wind, so no shade, and he's basically putting Jonah in the popcorn popper. Um, he's roasting him. And Jonah is miserable, and he wanted to die, and he says, it would be better for me to die than live. And God just says, do you really have the right to do this? And Jonah says, I do, and I'm angry enough to die. And we kind of leave not knowing what happens to Jonah. Um, does he change his heart? Does he repent? Or does he just sit there and be miserable for a long time? But what we do see is that the Lord says, you've been concerned about this vine more than all of these people. Look, here are 120,000 people who don't know their left from the right. They don't know what to do. They don't know the right thing. And I have compassion on them and I care for them as well as all of their cattle, their animals. Should I not be concerned about this great city? And we're left hanging there not knowing what happened really to Jonah. I think it's interesting to look at this in the sense that Jonah in some ways is the, like the antithesis of Isaiah. He's the opposite of Isaiah. What happens at the beginning of Isaiah? God makes himself known to Isaiah. And Isaiah, you have the, whole, the, the holy, 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 and the woe is me, I'm undone. And then he says, who will go? And he says, here I am, send me. So total volunteer, right? I'm, I'm willing to respond in worship and with my life to your will. And then God tells him what? You're going to spend your whole life preaching and nobody's going to listen to you. Jonah is the exact opposite of that. God shows up, says, this is what I want you to do. 
and there's no, here I am, send me from Jonah. He jumps on a ship and tries to get out of there. And incidentally, every single person that Jonah talks to in this entire book repents and worships the Lord. Every single one. He is the worst he has the worst attitude of any prophet, perhaps, in the Old Testament and is the most effective revival speaker you've ever seen. Even the people that throw him off of the ship fall down and worship the Lord in response to that. An entire city, 120,000 people repenting in sackcloth and ashes, and he's mad about it. It's, he's the opposite Isaiah. God is working through him. But what I want to point out here and where I want to begin to dig into this as it maybe begins to apply to us and we think about what it is that we are as humans what God might be wanting from us, is I would just like to point out this. The Lord sent a prophet. The Lord appointed a storm. The Lord appointed a fish. The Lord appointed a vine or a gourd. Uh, some translations have gourd. The Lord appointed a, a gourd. The Lord appointed a worm. The Lord appointed a wind. So there are all of these appointments, gourds, wind, fish, everything, you name it. There is only one creature in this entire story that when God appoints it, he has trouble with. And it's Jonah. It's the human. The worm does what it's supposed to. The fish does what it's supposed to. The wind does what it's supposed to. The gourd does what it's supposed to. All of them, God speaks and they do it. He appoints them, he orders them, and they instantaneously do it. The only creature who is appointed or sent in the book of Jonah that is miserable about it is Jonah. It sets us up, this is why I say it's not a kid's story, because it sets us up with this difficult tension of what does it mean for God to work out his will while using his creatures? Because why does he send, why does he send Jonah back? Why doesn't he just pick somebody else? Why does he have to send Jonah in the first place? So there's some points here where you can say, God, there would be some easier ways than using this miserable dude, Jonah. Um, why do you have to use him anyway? So there's that whole element going on. And then there's the question of, did God accomplished his will through Jonah. And the answer to that is, yes, absolutely he did. How did that work out for Jonah? Well, it was a little difficult. There was a fish involved with that. Um, but there's this idea that we're, we're understanding through the book of Jonah, this idea of the sovereignty of God and his ability to command and control and to order. We like singing that hymn in the evenings to our children, be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. And you remember that line, um, leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. And there's that idea of, be still my soul, the wind and the waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. And that is a right and a good thing to sing. We see this throughout the New Testament. We see this throughout the Old Testament, that God speaks and he orders creation and nature and has total control over those, except for this one little problem called humanity. It's the human in the problem that is sometimes difficult. And so when we look at this idea of the sovereignty of God and human freedom, this really has big implications for how it is that you see yourself in relation to God and what you think your responsibilities are. And I don't think there's actually any type of a conflict there. There are theological systems that try to work one in there, but I don't see a, con a conflict there. Rather, I see a God who created us to be complex. The way that we are is the way that we are because of a sovereign God who has the power to create a creature that can freely choose to do something. Which, actually, if you think of a God who can orchestrate his will in the world while using creatures who have genuine freedom to accomplish God's will, that is a God worth worshiping. That's mind-boggling. I can't quite piece that together, but that seems to be the theme of what's happening in here. And so God can continue to accomplish his will while giving freedoms to humans, and that is the foundation, I think, of understanding that relationship that puts us in the proper posture of worship. Now, Note something here is that it's not only, Jonah was not only the only one who disobeyed, Jonah is also the only one who claims to worship God in this entire thing. Certainly the sailors do after they repent and the town of Nineveh does, but he says that to the sailors on the boat, I worship God. And so there's something about this ability to say no to God's commands that makes the worship legitimate. Now, we might look at this and say, Jonah was a lousy worshiper, but he had this concept built in there of God's goodness. He says, he says you know, it's not like he didn't believe in God. He said, I know that you are a good God, that you're slow to anger, that you're compassionate. He listed it all out there. Um, he understands who God is. He, he worships. And so there's that complexity of human nature that we don't have the worm worshiping, the gourd doesn't do any worshiping, the fish doesn't do any worshiping. It's humanity that is called to worship 
this sovereign God. And so God does complete what he sets out to do. That always happens. But doing it, again, just to reiterate the point with a creature that can say no, um, that's amazing. Now, that doesn't mean that if you say no to God, there won't be some consequences of that. My grandfather says that he likes to get up in the morning and give God his attention because he's found that it hurts when God has to get his attention. So it's better to start off just giving it to him than having him take it uh, or need to get it. So that's the... the, the, the the, the kind of the theological framework of what's going on there. But as we turn the corner and begin looking at what that might mean for us through just our cursory glance through Jonah here and, and even for our very lives and hopefully certainly for this week as we lean into it, is that there's some important things here. One of those is that Jonah's problem was not a lack of belief in the existence of God. Oftentimes when we say that we believe in God, we, we're saying that as if we can say that if I provide intellectual assent to the category that I believe in the existence of God, that means something spectacular. And it doesn't. So James says, oh, you believe in the existence of God? Cute. <laughs> so do the demons. There, there's nothing to it. Jo- Jonah's problem was not the existence of God. And actually, Jonah's problem wasn't the character of God. He knew that God was good. In fact, he thought God was a little too good. Uh, that's not the issue. And Jonah's problem was not a lack of information. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do and just said no to it. And so many times I think it's interesting when we're thinking evangelistically or apologetically in our discipleship formation that the biggest barriers and hang-ups that people have, which is sometimes totally true, is that inability to believe in the existence of God or I'm not sure that God's provided enough clarity of what he wants me to do or I don't know what God is like. Um, All of those were eminently clear to Jonah and he still looked at it and said, think I'll take a boat. So there's an obedience issue that comes into here that God can make himself clearly known to us and we can still reject it. This is not actually unique to the Old Testament in general, certainly not the book of Jonah, but also think about the New Testament. What does Jesus do? What is his posture toward humanity? When Jesus shows up on the scene who is the the fullness of the character of God, and we can talk about that, I think we will later in the week of when we're trying to figure out what God is like in that question, we're looking to that, the, the image of Christ there, but in this, this idea of Jesus' interaction with the world, what does Jesus do? Does Jesus have trouble raising the dead? No, not at all. Healing the sick? No. Multiplying loaves, coming up with fish? He can do it all. Jesus calms the storm, walks on the water. The list goes on and on of things, spectacular things that Jesus does in his interaction with nature, yet he weeps over the hearts of, of the men of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Jesus can do everything, and you would just say, well, why not go the next step? Why can you, if you can order the storm, why can't you order repentance? If you can order the storm, why can't you command obedience? And so we start to see something magnificent, not just about who God is and accomplishing his will through the characters and the creatures that are like us, but we start to see that there is an increased responsibility that humans have as we come to more fully understand the sovereignty of God. So rather than having this reverse effect of saying, well, God's got this and he's in control, I don't need to pray, I don't need to be obedient, whatever, God's going to do what God's going to do, that's actually not the biblical message that comes out of this. Lots of people do (laughs) function in that framework, but I don't think Jonah specifically here allows us to do that. And so I think the the question that I want to walk away from this quick glance through Jonah and hope you'll join me in doing is asking myself the question, what about you? Are you an appointable person? The worm is, the fish is, the gourd is, let's join the club, right? Are you an appointable person? Are you the type of person or do you even think in your mind that if God clearly revealed himself to you and said, I want you to do this, would you do it? And we often, I think, trick ourselves by saying that if God came to me and made himself known and said, I want you to do this, that we would automatically do it. And Jonah challenges that assumption. So it puts it back on us. I think, and commentators have said, uh, skimming over the end of a couple commentaries, are saying that might be part of the reason that the book of Jonah is, is left kind of open-ended like that. Like you just leave Jonah there being miserable. Um, is because it invites us into thinking, well, what is our part in this? How do we... How do we concept, what's the rest of the story? But what, how do we fit into the rest of what that story is? Are we appointable? Will we actually do what God asks us to do? We know that he exists. We know that he is good. But will we do the thing that he asks of us? 
In, in chapter 2, in verse 8, while Jonah is, is praying in the, in the belly of the fish, I don't know how your translation has it. I remember when I was a little kid, this, this verse was uh, written and taped on our refrigerator door for a while. And it says this in verse 8, the first part, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. That's the 84 NIV version of that. The idea being there that those who look to idols forfeit the grace, forfeit the goodness, forfeit the mercy and the compassion that could be theirs because, you know what, if you're relying on something that you carved out, you're forfeiting the grace that could be yours. Jonah can see that clearly, that this is the best way. You are a gracious and compassionate God who relents on sending calamity. You don't get that from an idol. But the attraction to the idol is this, is that if you build an idol in your life, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs, but you know what else an idol doesn't do? An idol doesn't send you off on crazy missions that end up with you in the middle of a fish. And so there's a safety that we forfeit when we cling to the things that we idolize. Now, I doubt many of you have a little Buddha whose belly you rub in your nightstand at night, but there are other forms of idolatry that we can participate in very easily, and I'm not going to start naming those because just because I say mine, I might miss yours. You might have to come up with that list. You do need to come up with that list on your own. What are the things that are preventing me from being an appointable person? And I think for me, and broadly speaking for humanity, it's our attempts at self-preservation that are our enemies to our appointability. Yeah, but I got to take care of this. Yeah, but I need to do this. I am responsible for this. Lord, you can't ask me to do that because I'm in charge of this. What about these people? What about, and I think that's the heart of what Jesus is poking at, you know, the whole setting it aside, uh, not loving your family more spiel that he has. That's the challenge. Am I an appointable person? And if not, what is holding me back? And why not? Jonah's attempt was to flee from the Lord's presence. And we might think that on the first glance that that sounds like a crazy thing to do. Uh, But it might be something that you want to do too. And it's not unique to Jonah. Actually, think about Peter. Remember Peter in his first encounter with Jesus? What's he do? Get away from me, Lord. I'm, I'm not worthy. Isaiah responds to, response to our response to the holiness of God is that we're unworthy. As many wise people have pointed out, if you want to feel spiritual, don't get close to God. It's because it's when our, in our proximity to the understanding of, who, of the holiness of God that we recognize we're unworthy. And so there's a heaviness to the presence of God in our lives whenever we're trying to work against it and it doesn't fit with the plan that I have. Rid yourselves of selfish ambition, Paul says, because there's this odd discomfort that happens in our lives when the presence of God is made known and our will does not align with what it is that God wants from us. When we turn and we go with it, we experience it as as his love, but when we rebel against it, we receive it and we experience it as his wrath and his suffering. It's a miserable thing. And so there are times in your life, I bet you've been under conviction about something and you felt a little bit Jonah-esque. Ugh! The presence of the Lord, it's convicting, it's challenging, it's calling in your ancient Near East, ancient Near Eastern history correctly. There, there was a thinking that a lot of the gods were regional gods. So you have like the God of this territory or the God of this country who only has authority in that country where his worshipers are. And so if I can just hop over to the other country, then I get out, of, I get out from underneath the authority of this God. And that does not work with the God who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Jonah, there's no place he can flee. And the psalmists talk about this, right? Where could I go? So we start as something like Psalm 8, talking about the heavens declaring the glory of God, and God has placed his glory above the heavens. And so even beyond what we can see in the expanse of the skies, God's grandeur and glory transcends that. And then it works its way down. When I consider the moon and the stars, the works of your hands, um, and then the works of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? And so the psalmist helps us out here with this Jonah problem with this modern people problem with the modern Nathan problem of recognizing the supremacy and the sovereignty of God and the gloriousness of who he is and then trying to figure out what in the world are you doing with somebody like me, Lord? What is man that you are mindful of him? What is fill in the blank with your name? Why would God care? And then what's fascinating about that is is that when we recognize and we see ourselves in the position of God's splendid presence over all of existence, that we feel small in light of that, but then the psalm continues on beyond that and shows that we have responsibility on the other side of that. So we feel small. We can't figure out why God would include the creatures of the likes of us in this plan when clearly we're the ones who can be disobedient in it. Um, And then you have put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, 
fish of the sea, birds of the air, all that swims the paths of the deep. That would include great sea monsters, I guess. There's no place in that order that we can go and flee from the presence of God. And so the question is, what are we going to do with the presence of God? This morning as I was listening, as your leadership was praying, they started off the prayer not knowing what I was speaking on with that. Lord, would your presence be made known here today? Would your presence be made known among us? Moses prays that, that God's glory would be made known. And so I think there's a, a fun challenge that I want to set us up to, to push into this week as we study and we think and we wrestle together of recognizing that the Lord's presence is everywhere and that he is sovereign and he is in control, but that there's a human responsibility that is embedded within that and he has chosen us to be part of his work. That's the only good justification I can come up with why Jonah is in the story of Jonah is because God wanted Jonah to be in the story of Jonah and wanted to use him. And so I think there's a way in which Jonah is part of the audience of the book that's written about Jonah. It's not just the Ninevites that needed to get sorted out, it's also Jonah that needed to get sorted out. And so I think there's a tremendous time in our culture right now of it's not just the world that needs to get sorted out, it's sometimes the church that needs to get sorted out before we're ready to engage in the way that God has for us. And so the church, we are the audience that God is speaking to and wants to work in. He enables us and calls us and puts us in this. The story is open-ended. How much of a Jonah are you? How much of a Jonah am I? But the conclusion of this is very simple, and it's one that I can't answer for you. I know that the, the call is there. Jesus' call is to come and follow me. And you know what? Not everybody did, did they? Some people followed Jesus for a little while and left. Some said, that's too hard, and Jesus didn't change his mind. He turns to his disciples and said, hey, you want to go too? Uh, this is classic in the history of humanity's interaction with God, that God can show up, and he can call people, and he can speak to people, and he can clearly teach and command and call and invite and a, and a point, and anoint, and order, and we can say no. Doesn't mean there aren't consequences to the, the rejection, for sure. But there's an invitation in that. And so I think it's just all that I wanted to do this morning was remind you that you can believe that God exists, you can know that He is good, you can know what He wants you to do, and you can still be a stiff-necked, we can join the Israelites and say no. But the bigger thing is, what does that mean for us to say yes? What does it mean for us to say, yes, Lord, I'm an appointable person? Uh, there's a tremendous invitation there. We can outdo the worm in the gourd because we can say yes out of obedience that then cultivates and, and ends in worship. And so I think that's what God's looking for, right? People who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Because we have recognized his beauty and we've responded to it and we've said yes to it. And then he wants to use us in this world. That's my prayer for me, that I would go into this week with that posture. Of a, a little more like a gourd and a little less like Jonah. A little more like a great fish and a little less uh, like Nathan. Let's be those people who can receive what God has for us. Recognize that it might be difficult. Say yes to it, but then recognizing that he is the God who accomplishes his will Rest in great care when he sends us to do difficult things. Amen.